This is the Team Objection Podcast for January 7th, 2021, a date that I have wrong in the planner, but I saved because I'm a fucking professional. I should, I should wear, like, Jim Shark or, like, Lululemon during the show. See if we can get, Why? like, a sponsorship, you know? I don't think sponsorships work by buying their stuff and wearing it on there, and they'd be like, wow, great. We're going to pay you now, even though you were giving it to us for free before. No, no, no. Well, no. Like, you know, when a celebrity wears Lululemon, that's great. Like, the, Lulu pays for that. I sh- like, not saying I'm a celebrity, but uh, it's yeah, worth a also, shot. I can you know, send them a clip being like, I wore Lululemon every episode for like a uh, hundred shows this year. Well, they negotiate <laughs> that ahead of time, so. That has not worked with Suns Gear, but maybe the Suns just don't have it in their marketing budget. <laughs> We'll see. It's episode 466, the first of the new year. And as such, we're tasked with doing what we traditionally have done for the past few years now, which is making our lists of the best of 2020, which is kind of a Herculean task this year. The list will be a disaster, just like 2020 was. I have a list from my category that I traditionally do. I haven't ranked them. I'll talk about why when we get there. Sean has a different approach that he's taking. Dave mentioned that television was a disaster. That's what he usually tackles. And all those things are true. I mean, pop culture in general, unsurprisingly, took a big backseat in the pandemic. If things weren't already made in the hopper, then they didn't really do a good job of coming out. I don't think TV was that bad this year. Um, And I am not here to tell you 2020 was actually a good year. But I thought TV was okay. I thought video games were basically the same, Um, if not a little bit better in at least in the way that i like oh this is great i really need this because i'm at home a lot movies i felt took a nosedive oh yeah that was Mm -hmm. the biggest one and i don't know so we have two movies that were supposed to save the box office neither one really did it no it would have helped if either of them was very good i will say yeah i was thinking about seeing the new wonder woman from whatever in the reviews i don't need to make a rush to do so here's my issue uh, since you segued in, it's kind of a review episode. What happened to the action? There's a lot of problems with that movie. The one that I want to focus on, though, is like the action in the first one was so good. It was unique. It was very like kinematic and dynamic looking. And in this one, it's like super floaty and lame and slow and a bunch of cuts and uh, it's terrible. I was like, I was actually looking up. Did they get like a different choreographer or something? Because the fighting sucks. Hmm. It's disappointing. It's trash. Because Wonder Woman's got a pretty like unique power set going for her. It's not powers per se, but you know what I mean? Like toolkit, whatever. <laughs> like she has a few things other people have, but the combination of them is pretty rare for her. So there's a lot of things you can do with that. And the first movie kind of showed off several of those in pretty well shot scenes, I thought. So here the second one is basically like this frequent cut trash that you see too often in action movies these days is kind of disappointing. Yeah. And really floaty and like really bad CGI. Not even with Cheetah. I didn't even mind Cheetah that much, but it was like when she's floating through the air or running flash TV show looks better speed running than she looks speed running. And this is a big budget movie. Uh, it was just really bad. Um, I didn't think the movie was really bad, but the action being so bad uh, made it have very kind of few redeeming qualities for me. And I care if I'm going to see an action movie, I want the action to be good. I'm sorry. That's important to me. Yeah. Like imagine the Marvel cinematic universe with trash action. Well, I mean like winter soldier <laughs> is my favorite in part because the action is so good. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you know, the actors spent weeks rehearsing like that knife fight, for example, it shows it, they could have gone in there and done a bunch of she- CGI and it wouldn't have been as good. They put in the time, and it really shows. All right. Well, Wonder Woman not on Sean's list for 2020. No. Tenet was the other one that was like, yeah, this movie kind of sucks. Yeah. <laughs> there is Inception-level high-concept movies that at least have a basic understanding to them. Now, how deep you go into that understanding is one of the core principles of Inception. You know, how how far you're willing to go into this and what you can glean from it and figuring out where everybody is at a given time. That's important, right? Tenet seems like the worst parts of Inception times 100 to me. So imagine you have Inception, but they don't explain it well, and you can't hear anything, and in the action, you can't even really follow who's who. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's Tenet. 
So all the convoluted parts, all of the, wait a minute, what happened there with Expanded? Great. Love it. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. And Inception, I think, is a wonderful movie, and it does a great job. Sometimes it's an exposition dump, but you kind of need it at times mm-hmm, to yeah. just... and But you walk away completely understanding the movie. I mean, you might get more out of Tenet than I did, and especially if you can watch it at home with subtitles, that might help. I couldn't understand it. Got... <laughs> There's a scene where they're on a boat. And so I already had a hard enough time hearing what they were saying in a room. Now they're on a boat and they're wearing like stuff on their face and they're talking. And I'm like, I, are they even saying words? I speaking English. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I feel like I do that a lot at home regardless to make sure I don't miss anything is turn on the subtitles, even if I can hear well, just because I don't want to miss anything. So oh, yeah, I mean, damn, I do that too. Uh, to oh. the chagrin of people around me sometimes. I do it now <laughs> as well. But the core difference is it's why I hate subbed anime is that I don't want to have to read it the whole time, but I do like having it on so I can check it. If there is a quiet line, a muffled line, someone with a heavier accent, who's harder to understand. I want them on to look down there on occasion. I don't want to read the whole goddamn time though. The problem is, I'm a pretty fast reader. You're a very fast reader. Uh, subtitles always spoil movies. So mm-hmm. anytime you see two dashes, you're like, well, that character's about to step on a landmine or mm-hmm. whatever. And you get <laughs> it does. That happens a lot, which is terrible. And the other problem is punchlines before the joke's even been set up. Yep. Yep. You can yeah. read to the end of it because your eyes are drawn to it. So you read the end, and before you even heard the build to it, which is half the joke. Now you already know what's coming, so you're like, oh, that's still good, but it kind of takes some of the steam yeah, out of it. Yeah. Try, try watching Jeopardy with uh, subtitles on. It doesn't work well. <laughs> what is go fuck myself for 600? <laughs> so how are we going to do this? Just one at a time still? Usually we just kind of tackle one person's lists, make fun of them for their choices, and then move to the next. But I'm happy to dive into some games. Um, if you want to take it, because I've been doing a lot of talking. I don't know if you guys have noticed over the course of however many episodes we have. I checked my watch because that's... What, where the episodes are kept for me. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, I can. If you want to take over for a bit, Chris, that's fine too. That's fine. Uh, I, I'm pretty much just going to yell out a few TV shows I saw this year because I, I can't rank them. It, it, I mean, Better Call Saul was the best, but there. After that, I don't know. Mandalorian? Uh, so the problem was I was waiting till Mandalorian Season 2 was finished. I believe it is now. However, I haven't started watching it yet. I believe uh, it is. It is. So okay. you can dive in safely now. Great. Fantastic. Um, was Good Place's fourth season at any point in 2020, or did it finish I last think year? It ended right at the end of 2019. Okay. So I was curious uh, if that could make my list of TV because I'm going through it now and I'm enjoying it quite a bit so far. I'm only oh, six nope, episodes never mind. in or so. But. So you can count it. Uh, the last one was January 30th. So we hey, indeed that's can what count I thought, it. So perhaps. It's weird it though is, because the pre pandemic time doesn't feel like 2020. <laughs> exactly. Even though like Kobe died in that span. Some other things happened. There was, you know, some. It, was a, it doesn't matter. It, the point is, like, the, the year feels like it was it started in March, yeah, but it definitely much. didn't. So, okay, that's one that counts. That was a really yep. good show that had episodes in 2020. Yep, yep. I have one other one that is definitely high up there, but I will wait we'll for that. Well, just do it. But... You already said Better Call Saul. Yeah, we're on television. And, like, we're doing it. Just keep going. Fine. Uh, we're doing television. Shit's Creek is the last one. I keep hearing, and Same. I don't, I think Martin Levy, or Martin Levy, is that uh, name? Eugene Levy. Eugene Levy. Is overrated, um, but maybe it's not the. Maybe he's really good. I just got so sick of him being in all the American Pie knockoffs. He's mm-hmm. not the same in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, he sounds the same. Don't get me wrong. Like you can see the comparisons between the two because it's the same person. However, this character is kind of the same, kind of not. Uh, the the star of the show is Daniel Levy, his son, uh, who plays. Oh, it's David. actual. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, he's fantastic. And I will say, watching Schitt's Creek, the first season doesn't have a lot of the charm, a lot of the hilarity of the later seasons. So it does pick up a lot of steam as it goes. Uh, It starts out setting the stage, basically. With what you've seen so far, was that show having a sweep of the top four actor and actress categories justified? So I haven't got to that season in which they swept. I can see where it would go towards that. I don't know top four. I could absolutely see, like I said, Daniel Levy winning it because he does a fantastic job. Uh, another person from the show, uh, his partner on the show is fantastic. Um, so I, I, that's the ones I would go for. Catherine O'Hara is actually very good too. I, she 
grated on me in the beginning of it. Like I was like, I can't even watch this because she's too over the top. And then after a while, like, okay, I understand the character. It got better. Essentially, you got to get to know the characters and then it gets better. I'm going to give it a try only because I've heard, I mean, to say glowing would be like an understatement. Like just yeah. the absolute best things. I wrote it off because it's not a good reason. Uh, the Eugene Levy thing was one, but I was like, oh, look at them. So clever. Shit's Creek is the title. And that was, <laughs> I was I, like, I'm not going to check that out. The, the, the title was like working too hard and not funny. I can't imagine what the show is like, but mm -hmm. apparently it's really good. It's, uh, look, I wrote it off for the same reasons. I thought that um, in the beginning, I don't like, uh, gosh, I'm blanking his name, Chris O something that's in it, uh, who I'm blanking his name is. Uh, he's been in a bunch of movies, always plays a really weird character. Same deal here. Can't, uh, same deal with that. And he, he graded on me as well. Like I said, the first season I watched that, and the only reason I kept going is because Courtney, my wife, told me that I needed to keep watching it because it gets better. If I would have just said at season one, I'd been like, nope, never mind. I can deal without this. But it did get significantly better as things went on. Funny how it works, though, right? All it takes is yeah. one little thing. With so much media to consume and us having less time than we did in our 20s, it's funny. Like, one thing can mm -hmm. set you off. And, like, Parks and Rec was that for me. If I hadn't already heard, ignore season one and hang with it, I would have watched season one and been like, nope. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Chris Elliott was the person I was thinking of. Uh, There's the barely show. anything that even made me laugh in season one. I like it's there, but it's limit. It's few and far between. In part, I and agree. Mm -hmm. And then you get the new characters, and it's just like, and the dynamic helps all the other characters. Yeah, because yeah, the majority of the characters in season one I don't like. <laughs> I find them to be annoying, one note, run of the mill characters, and. They get flushed out really well when you add when you shake up the the cast a bit, and as they come into their own more themselves too. So, uh, I don't have a lot to add for TV. I watched a decent amount of shows, but none of them were really from this year. Cobra Kai would garner strong consideration, but its first episode came out January first, twenty twenty one. So that doesn't count. It will for next year, and it'll be on my list. Um, so I don't have a ton to add. I'm mostly caught up on shows I hadn't watched before, like The West Wing, and uh, didn't watch a ton of new stuff. I, Mandalorian was good. I wish we could dissect it more. Dave, you're going to have to watch that next. I'll get on that. It gets like a little bit slow, which I don't mind. People are like, it's like video game side quests. <laughs> to which I say like, well, no, it's so it's just like a, it's just like little mini quests. It's not a video game thing to have a character do something that's not the main plot. Like <laughs> you don't have to deride it by saying it's a video game thing. Um, but then like it, it ramps up. I actually, I thought the whole thing was pretty enjoyable though. I have a follow-up question for you, Sean, from last year's review. Did you ever watch The Orville? No, not yet. I um, will get into this in my year in review. I don't watch a ton of TV compared to movies and games and, and even books. Um, those are like my main things. And then I'll, I watch TV with Maisie. That's my main way to watch TV. So like we got through a season of Ozark and we're most of the way through Handmaid's Tale, which everybody has an issue with. No, I like Handmaid's Tale, but you don't like Handmaid's Tale. Why? Okay. Why don't you like Handmaid's Tale? Um, it's more actually what surrounds Handmaid's Tale is every time a politician, a Republican politician wears a red dress, it's, oh my God, here it is. We're in living in the Handmaid's Tale. I'm like, shut up. Like, this is ridiculous, like, just hyperbole that actually hurts people's causes when they want to bring attention to things. Did so. you actually watch the Handmaid's Tale? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Oh, okay. I How much? Uh, mo I watched the whole first season and then kind of dropped off in the second season. Well... I mean, if you don't like it, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna recommend it. But I've really enjoyed it, and a lot of people that I've read reviews of have not liked this season, uh, which I think is really funny because I've liked it quite a bit. People, and I don't know this, but it seems to me they love it when there's no hope and it's not building towards anything. And it's like, here's a day in the life of this person. She's miserable. There's nothing to really look forward to, and you're like, great. And now they seem to be building towards like something and everybody's like, Oh, it's, I don't like it anymore. It's like, well, that's, I mean, in a way it feels almost exactly like the hunger games of the sense of like, 
here's where they, in the first book, it's like, here's where they live in this hopeless society. Well, and then she won the Hunger Games. Yay, she won the Hunger Games. And then the second and third book has to be about reforming society, which is season one of Hunger, have Handmaid's Tale into season two, which is reforming society, essentially. You're kind of onto something there, um, <laughs> believe it or not. But I believe it. But I liked it done more in Handmaid's Tale than I do in, because at least like you had a, in Hunger Games, there was still a point to the first one, even though it wasn't reforming society. It was like, you know, this fight for survival, finding a little bit of humanity. Yeah, you could barely even say that about a handmade cell. Mm -hmm. It was just, wow, this sucks. And to be honest, the last thing I didn't like about it was I had a hard time suspending my disbelief that the entire society of America fell apart in like a year and a half. Like this. <laughs> That's what no kids does, dude. Don't you know? Uh, I like. We're just going to subjugate all women who are our only hope as a species is that these few women that we can possibly, you know, have actually have children. No, no, no. We'll just subjugate them and make them into slaves and beat them until they some of them die because religion, I guess. Like, dude, I don't yeah, know. it's I crazy. Everybody's baby crazy in that show, though. Like literally, like obviously from the surface, but then like you have the character. She'll like hate everybody. She'll. Elizabeth Moss, she's a great actress, but she does the eyes at the camera, which I'm so mad. And she sees the baby, she's like, oh my god. <laughs> like, okay. Kids aren't that cool. Yeah. Well, I, I, there's, <laughs> I don't, like I said, I had a hard time suspending my disbelief on it. That's all. Okay, well, that's our review of Handmaid's Tale. Uh, that's kind of my season. I, I'm trying to think of the other TV that I watched this year. Uh, I did watch one last one, started it at least, didn't get very far, uh, had its moments with Space Force on Netflix. I heard that wasn't that great. It's It tries to be, it tries to poke fun at contemporary issues, like it basically tries to poke fun at Trump without poking fun at Trump, like making these bumbling government agencies. The only redeeming quality is uh, John Malkovich. I would have That's... guessed that, actually. <laughs> There's a couple of movies of which that could be an apt description, too. Yeah. <laughs> He's fantastic. He's just great. Yeah, he is. Like this, his character is great, and that's it. Like the, Steve Carell is fine, but honestly, it's John Malkovich. That's the only reason the show has any hope. There's not really any chance for a show that's not willing to go all the way to make it on that style of humor in 2020. I don't think because the people who are, are who are going to be insulted by it are still going to be insulted because they're going to know who you're poking fun at, and the people who would be on board are going to think you didn't go far enough. So in the admit, by trying to stay in the middle, you've basically made no one laugh. Yep. Yeah. So good luck with that. Games? Do you, um, I, so I'm way behind on my list is my thing. So a lot of the games that would be in consideration, uh, Cyberpunk, Final Fantasy VII, uh, Ghost of Tsushima, a handful of others I haven't gotten around to yet. Um, part of that is pandemic. Part of that is just I got a PC, so I played like a lot of old games. A lot of old games this year. So that was really fun on on uh, not emulating. So um, I'm a little bit behind. But the my game of the year, even with all that said, is Hades. Holy shit. Does that count as a 2020 game? It came out. I think it does. Even I don't know that it does. It was in beta uh, for before that, but everybody, all the like outlets have it in their list, so I'm gonna have it in my list. Yeah, too. I don't actually mind it. I think it is a little bit sketch, but like as you said, a lot of a lot of places had it in contention for their game of the year, and it got its widespread support in 2020, even though a lot of people played it in the last year. It's so good. Every once in a while, there's a game. I'm gonna have to do a list someday of like the games. A game comes along where I'm like super addicted and it's the feeling of like just like one more thing, uh, one more run, one more day in XCOM, one more uh, uh, series of um, I don't even know how you say this, like the rounds in Persona 5 where you get to do your free time. A cycle or something. Like yeah, I I like want to finish that cycle. I look forward to the cycle more than the dungeons, even though I do enjoy the dungeons a lot. Um, and like that feeling is like, I'm so addicted and, and Hades absolutely gave that to me. I think I, I've had it for a week. I played it for more than 40 hours easily. Um, it's crazy. It's so fun. So you haven't slept. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't slept Dave. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm finding there's a lot more value in gameplay loops as I get older. And with that, those take many forms. It could be something simple like a Rocket League where the gameplay loop is just the game itself where it's a five-minute game of soccer cars and then you start over again. Or it's an advanced RPG where you have that type of a cycle where you go through different things and you do all of them in just enough moderation that you're eager for them to come back again the next time. Because there have been RPGs where you get caught in some kind of slaw. There's one of the activities or one of the core gameplay mechanics that's not very fun. So when it comes up, you're like, uh, all right, I just got to get through this to get to the next thing. And like you said, I also enjoy the time in between dungeons more than the dungeons, but I don't dislike the dungeons. No. I'm excited when they come up. Yeah. And then when they're done, I'm like, oh, cool. Now I get to do this again. And then when a dungeon comes, I'm like, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's been long enough. Yeah, <laughs> let's do a dungeon. You know, like those are perfect for me. It's why it's really hard for the narrative focused games that have eight hours in them to really resonate with me anymore. And they can be expertly crafted, really, really good experiences, but they still don't hold the same sway over me now. That's why my game of the year, my personal game of the year is Hades, even though I will say like Last of Us 2, I've really enjoyed. Uh, I know it's been a lot of controversy. I think I've thought it's great. I think it's very bold. I think it's really well done. It's like watching. It's like playing a movie. Um, but but Hades is it, it, it's so good. Um, it gives me that feeling behind it of like, oh my god, like I want to wake up early or stay up late and play more. Um, it's a roguelike, Dave. Do you know what that is? A roguelike? Yes. Mm-hmm. One word. No. Okay. So that's a game where I don't know all the tenants. Typically, it's procedurally generated levels that you run through. You unlock different abilities that are randomized each run. So it's always changing, like how you're gonna go through the game, um, but it's usually a pretty set progression in terms of like bosses. So the levels to get there change, and they're generated by a computer, but uh, uh, the the bosses are the same and the progression is the same. When you die, you start over, um, but usually there's a way to get permanent currency to unlock ways to permanently upgrade your character for every subsequent run. Mm-hmm. So it's, I mean, it's in some ways it's like old video games where like you die, you go back to the beginning, you have to do the whole thing, except Mm -hmm. now you get to start with a little bit of a boost. Mm -hmm. The only reason I bring that up is because in hate, most of the time in a roguelike, you die, you start over, each run is its own self-contained thing. In Hades, each run is part of the story. You're a god who's trying to escape uh, Tartarus. So like you die and everybody comments on how you died and how you're trying again and uh, all the relationships that you've built are still there. And so the, the cycle is part of the story and it's, it's as good as the gameplay itself. I could see how that would be enjoyable because there's a form of familiarity while also progressing. Yeah. Yeah. So in, it's almost like persona where like, yeah, the gameplay is fun, but I also love building these relationships and mm-hmm. unlocking these character quests and that uh, continuity is huge so Mm -hmm. i've just i've loved it i've never played a roguelike uh like it and it's definitely i mean it's the best it's so good i have a top five list as i usually do um i'm not ranking them this year as i mentioned part of that's because two of the games in my top five i haven't played so there's that (laughs) uh but first as always dishonorable mention it was a year full of dishonorable mention, and no none bigger than Cyberpunk. We don't need to talk about it at any great length, particularly the current yeah. gen releases of it. We talked about it last show, so go watch that if you want to hear you, us go even in Even I that. can't defend, the, if you're going to target especially the current gen one, yeah. I can say nothing. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's one of the worst video game releases of the last decade. Yeah. The next gen version and the PC version... Well, maybe not the full experience people were expecting. Seem like they're really good, and I will play one of those when I get a PS5 in 2023. But until that point, it, all I have is the system I could play it on right now. Which I like, Sean. I wasn't going to play it on these systems. I was going to wait for the next gen. Well, it's a good thing. Yeah. Because God, fucking thing. if yeah. I had got it for PS4 and been like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get a PS5 anytime soon. I'll just take a chance on this. Who boy. I, you'd probably just wait for the PS6 at that point, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm I mean, done with gaming for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a bad taste in my mouth. I'm going to just read some books for the next five years. See you later. Uh, dishonorable mention is Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered. Oh, yeah. For taking a game that I enjoyed quite a bit, even though it had a convoluted multi-GBA setup back in the day and basically ruining it. So you can be on Dishonorable Mention. Super Mario 3D All-Stars is on my Dishonorable Mention even though the game is fine on its own because their decisions with it are extremely wacky and I don't like the precedent it sets. 
So that can go on dishonorable mention. And Last of Us 2 gets to go on dishonorable mention because I don't want to play games that are misery porn. This isn't too bad. It's really... Well, I'll wait for my full ver. I haven't gone all the way through, but it's it's like the first one was highs and lows and roller coaster. Um, when all the main characters die, then I maybe I'll change my tune. As I say, because you already know what happened near the start of two. Yeah. So um, and that was kind of leaked in advance. There were spoilers. I don't want to talk about it a ton, even though the game's been out for months now. But uh, if you know, you know. And I'm not even saying that characters should be immune to certain situations. It's just frustrating because it's the same problem as The Walking Dead. It's like if all I have around me are assholes and characters I didn't want to live in lieu of characters that did, I did want to live and didn't, then why am I here? So We'll have a discussion at some point. I, and, I, and I'll even grant you, like that's just me personally, but it is my list. So a game like that gets the fuck right <laughs> off. Because I think there are some people who would enjoy the hell out of it and clearly have. They actually enjoy that type of storytelling but to me, it's like, it's the same problem with Uncharted. I look at games like that, and I think these are really well made, and they feel lifeless to me, and I don't enjoy my time with them. It's exactly how I felt playing Uncharted. It was like, this has no enjoyment whatsoever. Yeah, I, I get the lifeless thing with Uncharted, too. Yeah, I don't really know why. It seems to have the ingredients that I would like, but yeah. I don't feel super engaged when I play it. And them. it's not bad. There are good yeah. games. Like Even I'll admit, those are all good games, but I, it just does not resonate with me. So Misery porn. Just like The Handmaid's Tale. That was, well, that was the yeah, thought I was going to have. When, before we segue to other things, I was actually going to jump into my list off of that with that as the tag. But <laughs> yeah, but Ozark is misery porn, too, and I like that a lot as well. I stopped watching that, when too, he drowned the baby? Except you know, he didn't really, but you thought he might have. I missed that part because I stopped That's watching. The very end of the first season. <laughs> first season? He holds a baby underwater for like five minutes, and you're like, holy shit. And then he brings him up because he was just hardcore baptizing him. But for a minute, you were like, am I watching a baby be <laughs> Is that what's happening? Oh, shit. Uh, honorable mention goes to Super Mario 35, which, while not anything great and not as good as the Tetris version, has still been enjoyable for me. Not anywhere near good enough to make a top five, but I, it was a game I enjoyed this year, which was few and far between, at least of 2020 releases. And Fall Guys, which was kind of like American Gladiators in a Battle Royale, which, again, I got some enjoyment out of. So you get to be an honorable mention. It felt like American Gladiators meets uh, Wipeout meets Mo MXC, like the most extreme elimination challenge. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. With, without the over-the-top commentators, sadly. Which I'm sure some people have done versions of. Yeah. Like, I have not looked for that content on YouTube, but I bet someone has had that thought and been like, oh, yeah. we'll just take these runs and make fun of people and make up fancy names for them. And there you go. That's the formula. Yeah. <laughs> Top five in no particular order. Um, Final Fantasy VII Remake is on my list. Have not played it. And uh, actually, as it turns out, as I'm looking at this, only one game that made my top five I have not played. Whoops. <laughs> Good. All right. I like to well, think Cyberpunk would once the time comes. Again, who the fuck knows? I mean, <laughs> at this point, I'm thinking maybe next summer I'll have a PS5. I, I what don't you know. should do is play Witcher 3 in the meantime. I probably should at some point. I've got that uh, queued up for after I finish Persona 5 Royal. That's my next one. So. Hey, speaking of Persona 5 Royal, it's on my list. Hey, I figured yeah, it might be. Yeah, I thought to... I thought about it. It's cheating, but it is the definitive version of what was the game of the year for 2017, so it seems like it'd be weird not to when it is better. It's con I mean, it's confirmed that that Persona 5 Royal is canon, essentially. Like, the vanilla is the story, it's just not the full story, basically. Yeah, and the full story works as a standalone in the original, and I don't feel like it was lacking the stuff that the, that Royal added. But now having gone through Royal, it'd be hard to go back to that and be missing some of these core characters and some of the mm -hmm. gameplay upgrades. Yeah. And that would yeah. be hard. I've so. still I've still got a little bit left. I'm on Saiya's Palace, so almost there. Trails of Cold Steel 4 is on my list. It's the best of the Cold Steel games. We're only about halfway through it, but even so, I feel pretty confident having that on there because I think it's only going to get better down the stretch. Everything that these games have led up to is now paying off, so that's always nice. It's difficult to say if it's worth the investment in the other three games. Sean's too deep, so I think he should keep going. I can't recommend it today. They're too long, and you don't have the time. But 4 is really good. And uh, Streets of Rage 4 is on my list. It was really satisfying to have a modern-day beat-em-up that was a, such a delayed sequel because 3 came out in, like, God, early 90s. So uh, to have somebody pick up 4, introduce a lot of fan-friendly features to it, 
but still put in some modern amenities as well was surprisingly fun for me. I didn't expect I was going to like the game as much as I did. Streets of Rage, the original one, was like late 80s, I want to say. Probably. Something like that. Yeah. Or and, no, 91. I just looked it up. Streets of Rage was 91 was the first one when it came out. And I remember that game like back as a kid and being like, huh, you were just beating up everything. So mm-hmm. <laughs> The streets were full of rage. Yes, they were. And that is still and the violence. case in 4. Lots of rage, lots of people to beat up. Lots of streets. And it has up to four-player co-op, and there's a really good juggling system, so you can get some obnoxious, in a good way, stuff going on there where you just batter enemies to death because you're just surrounded and just punching and kicking them and juggling them forever. That's pretty satisfying. And the final game in my top five, again, not in any particular order, is Shantae and the Seven Sirens, which is cheating a little bit. Technically, the mobile version of that came out in 2019, but it released on all the platforms anybody gives a shit about, like Switch, PS4, etc., in 2020. And I don't even think it's the best Shantae game, but I enjoy the series quite a bit. It's Metroidvania-esque, but a little more lighthearted. And this game was good. I think Half Genie Hero from a couple years ago was better, but it was still good enough just to squeak in. It would have been the lowest of the five if I was ranking them. That's my list. I cannot comment a thing about that. I'm watching a trailer video for it right now. It reminds me of Pokemon. At least the trailer video does. (laughs) That's weird, but all right. Just the the style of animation. That's all. <laughs> I suppose I could see that. I did. I did my year in review. So I don't know. Finally, I don't know if you guys actually know this about me. Uh, you know a lot about me. I love categorizing things. I love it. If I do a thing, I write it down, and I'm taking it to like new levels. I want to do. Okay. So let me introduce this. So. I did it for this year where I counted how many games I played um, and how many uh, books I read. Um, I do it with, with races that I do. I didn't do any this year for uh, reasons. I'm sure you can guess why. And uh, movies is, is hard. I, I watch a lot of movies and I'll catch one like here or there and I don't care as much. But games and books. Um, but then I realized if I say I beat 50 games... Some of those are like the Castlevania series where I was beating a Castlevania a day because they're so short. Um, and I was using an emulator to help with the difficulty. So I want to do like like a Gantt chart too of like when the game started. Do you, you know a Gantt chart, right? Maybe. Gantt chart is like, it's, it's like a, it's like a, it's like, a, it's a chart where you would have like a dates and stuff, but uh, it also shows uh, there's a overlapping of when something started and when something ended. So you ah, get all these like yes. different colors and overlaps and things like that. And a I want to do one chart. for games. And I also want to rank the game based on a code system of like, I'm thinking probably like, I don't know, zero to maybe just each 10, 10, 10 hours to completion is a different category. So then it's like, I beat you know, five platinum games this year. Well, it's only five, but that's like a bunch of games of like Persona 5's length versus like Copper, which is like five hours. Well, yeah. I mean, I had a similar uh, thing earlier this year where I beat uh, The Legend of Zelda 2. We talked about earlier in the on this, this year where that took me like basically two or three nights to beat merely because I could use the emulator and use the assistance that came from that. And it was a really short game. So I can count that as a game beat, but it doesn't have the same level that uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 did. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, so I want to categorize it. So I'm not at that level of sophistication yet. But um, I beat something like 25 games last year. This year, um, well, in 2019, I should say, 2020, I beat 49. So that's pretty good. Um, and I read four books. And uh, that was down from last year, which was six. Um, but and I and I also kind of cheated because I I was looking at my list, and by December I had only read two, and I was like, this is really bad, to only read two books in a whole year. So I like managed to sneak in two books at the end of the year. Now I'm reading the new Hunger Games book. Dave, you read that? I started it. I never finished it. Did you get to the part where that girl gets her throat slit? Nope. I haven't got that far. I know You're it's probably early, far. but no, I'm not at all. I'm like two chapters in. And the problem was I'd start reading at like 1130 at night and be like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my goal for next year is eight books. It's a lot. Eight. I read Brave New World. That oh, was I've weird. Read that. I've read that one. 
That was weird. Yeah. It, Not uh, really enjoyable, but like it was interesting. I think for the time it was written, it was probably way more interesting than it is now. Yeah, some cool ideas, but you're just like, man, all these characters are awful. That's, and then the only character the you want to root for takes everything entirely too far the other way. He's like, I don't want to live in this utopia. And you're like, cool, good on you. He's like, I'm going to whip myself. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, sure. And I'm going to like smack this girl around because she wants to do me. And it's like, come on, man. So, yeah, that was weird. But yeah, That's I'll take got. requests. I'll take book requests. I have a few lined up, but I have a goal of 10 pages a night at a minimum. That way, no matter what, I'm making progress. But a lot of times I'll start and I'll read like 15, 20, 30 pages because I'm into it. If I'm not into it, I still did the 10. It's like making your bed first thing in the morning, you know, <laughs> like that uh, army guy says. Uh, so that helps. I, I found myself, I don't know if you guys run into this reading books, but there are times when if I'm kind of like forcing myself to read something, I'll read 10 pages and then be like, the fuck did I just read? <laughs> yeah, you got to not be distracted because I will, I will do that. Yeah, that happened to yeah. me in school too. Yeah, oh, me all it was the a time subject I was totally disinterested in, and it was like, all right, I, I read the required reading. Uh, what was what, in there? What, what did I read just now? And then I'd be like, well, that wasn't on the material. And I'd open the book, the page, and be like, oh, it's right there, like yeah. literally. God, that, and you know, did it ever happen to you where it was like word for word? Oh yeah, like Verbatim, a prompt yeah. from the quest, uh, a quiz yeah. or a test was like word for word something <laughs> that you were supposed to have read, and you're like. Yeah. Well, I really can't complain about this. That's on me, huh? Whoops. Yep. Do you guys have I read anything it. where you haven't read? Because you do a lot of reading for work. I do a lot. We probably all do a lot of reading for work. If you if it's been a while since you've read fiction, there's like a, a barrier uh, to entry there of like getting your mind like in the same rhythm or something again. I don't know if you guys feel this. There's... I become very hyper aware that I'm reading and I'm not just like immersed in the words. I'm like, there's like a separation there. Well, that's, that's the nonfiction. When you're reading something technical, you're reading something that's more designed to deliver information, nonfiction. You have to focus on the words and their exact meaning of what it implies as it goes forward. A fiction book for me, at least when I try to read a fictional book is I am basically creating this world in my mind. I'm imagining the, the place, the colors, the people, the voices. Like I'm trying to imagine all these things and create this world in my mind while I'm reading the, the words as opposed to for work where I'm just like, I got to read this word and make sure I don't miss a point, like that type of thing. Yeah, I think mine are different enough, but there's one other core difference to me, and it's that I only read fiction in books. Everything else I read is on a computer screen, whether it's for fun, you know, like about basketball or it's for work, you know, all the articles I consume, those are always on a computer. I don't ever actually pick up our print edition anymore. I haven't for years. So if I'm reading on a screen, I usually know it has to do with something like that. And then if I'm reading a book, that's almost always fiction. I read a handful of like nonfiction things and a few other things, but generally I have like a tangible book in my hand. So I already kind of know that's a different experience going in. I can see where you're coming from. It's just not something I experience. It's I, I, I have a pretty clear divide for me. Even like with authors, it'll be like, it takes me a second to like, I'll have to reread like a page a few times because they, the way that they write is so different and you have to get used to their voice and their like nuances, their, their mm -hmm. pacing and all of that. Um, I think it's cool though, but it also, it shows me like if I struggle with it, it's like, wow, it's been way too long since you've done this. Hmm. I wish I was reading more. I've Me kind of too. fallen off the way. And I don't know if that's just because as I get more into this job, I'm just reading so much that it doesn't seem like a fun activity on the side. But I do still enjoy reading on the side, so I don't know why I don't do it more. I, yeah, uh, yeah, it's fun. I, I, again, two books last year was like, that, I, that was, I used to read like a book a week when I was in school. They're short books. They're like Goosebumps or whatever, but uh, Animorphs. But still reading. I I've got to pick a lot of times between whether I want to watch TV, play a video game, or read a book. And uh, to try to catch up on video games that I've been wanting to play, that the books have been forced to take in the back seat. See, I usually get to do all three, so well, if I had to choose, that would be tough. Yeah, if I had to, uh, if I had could come home from work at five o'clock and not do anything till I go to bed at uh, or do whatever I want till eleven o'clock when I go to bed, it'd be really easy. That's pretty sweet. I just kind of lean towards whatever gets me the most separation from reality. 
So if I'm immersed in a particular TV show, I usually kind of like binge that till I'm finished. If it's a game that's taken my interest and allows me to kind of get out of my usual day-to-day -day routine and like, you know, just immerse myself in a different world, then it's a game that I kind of plow through. I'm not really ever juggling multiple at the same time because if it books the same way too. If I get into a book, like I usually read it cover to cover within you know, mm -hmm. a week or two, um, which has been good, but I think it's why I haven't done many books because I haven't been picking them up. There's no chance for them to get a hold of me. So then they just kind of, it's like, oh, well, this game most recently has my attention, so I'm just going to play that. And now what's next? Oh, well, I heard this TV show was good. Let's start that finally. And I don't know. It feels like being lazy. I probably should be better about it. Yep. God, I have, I'm right now reading two books, playing three games, and watching like a myriad of TV shows, just a bit, uh, comedies. And I have this for, I have this uh, TV show when I'm eating and I only have 30 minutes. And this one when I take a lunch break and I have a longer amount of time. And, I, I'm in a lot of stuff. Oh. I kind of like just having one at a time, but it usually works out to where I'm doing like eight. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, I'd like to trade lives for a day. Just for a day, I think. I wouldn't. No, <laughs> your kids seem cool. I'm skeptical of what you just said. <laughs> yeah, your kids seem cool. That would be a they, soundbite you have for later, though. But like only, only trade for a day means I could come be like the fun uncle, so... It's true. Yeah. It's a true story. What time's bedtime? Doesn't matter. Stay up all night. <laughs> you don't have to deal with it tomorrow. <laughs> What's for dinner? Chocolate like lunch. Let's go. There's three of you and one of me. So we're doing Halo on Legendary. Co-op. Let's go. <laughs> uh, that'd be a disaster. <laughs> Although I do get to play I do get to play Breath of the Wild for my son because he asked me to. So that's fun. Yeah, we're going to get to do a lot more of that in a few years. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I can't wait to crush your kids in basketball. I think about it every day. <laughs> I'm glad that that's your driving force. I don't. None of your kids want to play basketball, though. Oh, that's not true at all. They very much do. I thought you said Caitlin. Oh no, she she's kind of into it. I thought I feel like she's the most into it. Uh, they both like to play. Uh, Caitlin likes to watch it more than Alex does, but he's also four, so I'm going to give him a little pass on that one. <laughs> okay, there's time yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was really thinking you were going to say you were going to crush them at a video game, but I like that you instead went for the one where your physical prowess means you definitely will. I want to crush them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in video games, they're, I'm sure, especially as my reflex is slow, <laughs> um, they're going to beat me, but that's that's oh, yeah. okay. Can't wait to play NBA tw uh, 2K2030, and my son just kicks my ass up yeah, and down the Yeah, but I was court. always <laughs> bad at that game. But 2K30 is going to be a PS7 exclusive, and we won't have those until at least three years after that. It's fair. Okay, so never mind. I don't even worry about it. Yeah, stop getting your hopes up. They're just going to be crushed. <laughs> we got to do a thing where if the three of your kids can ever beat the three of us in a game, we have to do something really nice for them. But I don't trust you two to not take it easy, actually, so I don't know if I, if I want to... Oh, if we're playing for stakes, I won't take it easy. Oh, no, okay. also There's a competitive playing, side of me. Okay. Also, if we're playing next year, yeah, we're not going to worry about it. If we're playing 15 years from now. Yeah, we're idiot. Gonna I'm not going to say next. James is going to be like how old next year? Two. Yeah, I'm not meaning next year. <laughs> Let's play Twister. He doesn't even know what colors are. Great, we win. Oh, you fell over again because you don't have motor skills. What a loser. When they're in their 20s. Is when it's going to be a maybe danger zone for us, I think. Because we'll be in our 50s. But we'll see. I'm still going to crush him. It's, this is going to be on you, Dave. Are you going to take care of yourself when you're 50? Mm, best I can. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> That's not a good answer. Yeah, I was going to say, what's your best, though? Uh... I'll be your life coach so your kids can never win in sports. Basketball. Maybe there's a sport they can win at. It's not going to be basketball. It's though. not going to be basketball, no. It'll never be basketball. Don't worry. That I'll still keep my skills sharp. I don't think it'll be soccer either. Um, or racquetball. It could be volleyball. It's not really a one-on-one -on -one type of well, game. Well, no, but like a team. I mean, like mm -hmm. they're going to go three-on-three. -three. If they win, we'll buy them like a car or something. <laughs> they got to get through me in volleyball. Uh, yeah. That's true. Yeah, so we have different... <laughs> I am to Kristen volleyball, lose a step, but, but it's you fine. are to basketball. <laughs> I still have ways in my game I could definitely get better, especially my server receive, but I've become a much better overall player than I was a few years ago. And I already had really good height and upfront ability. Look, they don't stand a chance. It's fine. No. Good. I can well, just keep sure talking shit it. about these kids who won't be in a position to act on this for at least a decade, but 
when it comes, we're going to beat the shit out of them. And they can't prove otherwise until 2030, so it's going to be a running bit, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, at the very least, we can have, like, the first game in about seven or eight years. That's about the age where I was at least having, like, semi-competitive games with my uncle and dad. I remember beating my dad in basketball. I was, like, 11 or something like that, so... I think the only sport they have a chance in is soccer at that age. Yeah. Because we can't How is anybody going to shoot over me even if I don't jump? <laughs> it's not oh, going to happen. Yeah. Well, yeah. It right. probably wouldn't happen with either of you guys. It sure as hell isn't happening with me. Yeah, but I'm good at soccer. I know. And I think Dave is good at football. But mm -hmm. soccer, they might be able to like tire us out or something because we will be you know, seven, eight years older then. So they could maybe run us ragged that – the foot speed aspect of that, even if the skill isn't up there, would be something that might give them a chance. They're not gonna run they're not gonna tire us out in basketball or volleyball. They could beat me in tennis, Dave. I I have never played tennis. Nor have they, so Yeah, <laughs> that's true. It would be <laughs> funny watching us all just suck at tennis. I haven't played in fifteen years. I probably the last time I played was with you, Chris, so probably, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't very good then. I couldn't even nope. make our high school team. So Me neither. Oh like our twenty twenty review. We're talking about 2030 sports mm -hmm. in 10 years from now mm -hmm. it was bound to happen Come there wasn't much to talk about in 2020. 2020 you know it was yeah. a shitty year that didn't release a lot of the stuff that it was going to and then the second half of it they couldn't make anything new so unless you know tom cruise wanted to yell at people for six hours straight even then that so, won't when's that supposed to come out any idea i don't i don't know yeah so we'll see it's going to be probably a quiet 2021 as well i mean what's going to change about the first six half uh, the first six months of this year Hey, know. you know what though? The Suns in 2020 were pretty great. Mm -hmm. That's a nice thing for yeah. No one can ever take the Suns 2020. Even they could lose the rest of this season. Now they were good in 2020. Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even even the early part of the season pre-pandemic, they were okay. They had a, a pretty bad losing streak that stretched into 2020. Yeah, you got the bubble and the start of this season. Like yeah. mm -hmm. that'll and, be forever. And we can say that was 2020, even though that it really just amounts to like four weeks. But hey, four <laughs> weeks bad. of positive Suns basketball was better than the last five years combined. So I'm fine with that. Yeah. 12 games. That's about what we got. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That is the end of this episode. Thank you for watching. As always, in between episodes, you can find us at our website, objectionnetwork.com or at youtube.com slash objectionnetwork for new videos seven days a week. We'll see you next time.